this morning we have Haida Hatri, and um, she's in from New York, and Arden Gonta will be introducing her. So. Hello. Memento mori, reminder of death. Humans have had a fascination of death for, well, as long as humans have been human. Much of human art has always directly spoken of ever-present death. Yet in our art, we have also attempted to ignore death. We have tried to immortalize life subjects in paintings of beautiful day gone by, in portraits of loved ones past, and writing about an emotion that once haunted before the feelings withered away. Today I have the pleasure of introducing Haida Hatri, an artist who has brilliantly married the subjects of life and death in her art. In Haida Hatri's art, life exists in the memento mori. <laughs> Art celebrating life does not change reality. Among her many ex exhibitions is not a rose, flowers crafted from animal offal, that is, organs and parts discarded after uh, slaughter. Ms. Hatry had used this awful medium more literally in the past, constructing human busts from pig parts. But the bust immediately repelled viewers, so there was no room for conversation on the subject, and she decided to explore another medium. The not a rose flowers draw viewers in and then only afterward take hold as the realization of death does in nature. Haida Hatri's art and the art she loves disrupts the status quo. Once it engages our consciousness, it actively, sometimes aggressively, challenges our comfort in life itself. It commands us to pay attention to our humanity, to our humanity compels us to question the benevolent truths we have quietly acquiesced to, like the beauty of dead flowers. It forces us to reassess our permanence, Haida Hatri's art sends shivers down our spines as we confront aspects of our mortality that we have looked away from. And then we discuss. And then we are awake. Please welcome Haida Hatri. Hello. I'm very happy to be here and impressed by all of you being here. Um, I wanted to thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Leonard, um, for and everybody else who is in, involved. And last night, I learned about how this um, interesting college works. Actually, I can't see anything. Um, can we do something about not having so much light in my face? <laughs> is, can, can that be kind of turned? dimmed down or something? Is that possible? Or do I go somewhere else with this thing? <laughs> yeah, okay. I think that's better. Is that still okay for you? Okay. Um, and I learned that this college is actually an amazing place. Uh, that, that it totally works differently than everything else. And I love the way it works. And if anybody um, watches this lecture outside, Check out this college, it's awesome. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. It's totally different and it, it really um, understands that you are the students, human beings, and that it's about learning something about life. And I'm totally impressed. Really, I think that's wonderful. Okay. Um, I want to talk about me today. <laughs> uh, I was told. I should talk about me, that is. Um, and I will do that. I grew up in this house the first six years of my life. It's the castle of Holzgerlingen, a little village in um, the south of Germany. My grandfather owned that place. And on the other side of the bridge, the, the house is surrounded by water, and the bridge um, uh, leads to the stable, and he had a little farm. And my father, we had we had there seven pigs and ten cows and a few chickens. And in the back of the house, my grandfather told me or showed me how to kill chickens when I was less than six. And he also um, taught me how to skin rabbits, which was very interesting because of the sound it makes when you pull the skin off a rabbit. That's very vividly in my mind. Um, and 
my father had this idea that he really wanted to be a farmer, he wanted to continue to be a farmer, but there was no way of actually making a living with seven pigs and a few cows. So he had this idea to um, research what he can do to become a farmer or to stay, a, to be a farmer, but doing it in a way that he could actually uh, make a living. And he learned about this awesome thing, which was called, back then not, but now, factory farming. He thought that was fantastic. He could have a lot of animals and could be a farmer and still could make a great living. So I'm just saying that because I realized that I'm always talking about me having grown up on this factory farming, pig farm, and that sounds kind of like my father was a evil person, but it, it was a completely different situation, and it was developed, this, this idea to have a lot of pigs and to do it in a, in a way that you can make a living. It, had, it made sense, and it was not, it, it only the people who started with this, they were not aware of what that would mean and how that would develop, I think. In any case, um, I studied art practice in um, Heidelberg. Um, let me see how I can get there. Okay, whatever. Um, and I um, became a rare bookseller after I met my husband and I uh, studied art history at the same time, and I taught art in an art practice um, class at the same time, and I didn't have any time actually to work um, on uh, art, although I wanted to be an artist. I have a, a problem, I need... Um, and I, so I taught art, I was running the bookstore, I was um, uh, having a family, and I had no time to work as an artist, which I really hated, and I didn't know what to do. I really wanted to make art, but there was no time whatsoever. So I came up with this idea, or I had seen as a rare bookseller, that um, real artists made artist books like real books, and they painted some real images or some, some original stuff in the book. So I thought I could do that. I could just use a book which exists already. For example, a Rilke book, very cheap. I can tear out a few pages and then instead of this volume of pages, put some paint in it or some collages or some, some other material and make it to my own book. And the good thing about that was I could only make one page a day. I needed only a half hour or something to actually um, make it. I found different techniques how to deal with it, to, for example, delete some text and to include some images, some collages, or I found also a way to um, cover the pages with different material, in this case, for example, sand and a kind of binder, and I scratched the text in. I normally used my favorite poems, uh, poets to, um, uh, to kind of make the book or to illustrate it, or I found uh, my own language in, in deleted all, deleting all the words I didn't need, and making my own kind of poem. And um, that, was, that was an opportunity to, to kind of have a real interesting object at the end of whatever, how many months, because these books have at least 16 pages or something. So it takes a while to get there, especially if you have only a little time and no space. So that is good for, everybody can do that. Everybody can just go home and at the kitchen table, you can make a unique artist book, and then you have this unique thing, and it is so wonderful. I just encourage you to, 
to do this. Um, and after I, um, no, I, uh, then my life changed because my husband left me out of the blue. I had no idea what was happening and I was absolutely furious. I uh, wanted to kill him. And I didn't exactly know how to do that. <laughs> because it was so sudden, I couldn't plan it really. <laughs> so, but I had this sudden idea, as sudden as the whole thing happened, I could just go to the slaughterhouse, get bones from bulls, get intestines from pigs, get pig skin, get meat, get fat, get pig eyes, get pig eyelashes, and then reconstruct the whole guy, <laughs> dress him with his clothing we, he had still at home, sit him underneath of a tree where he was normally reading, and ask my friend, who had two pit bull terrier, to not feed them for a few days, and then they would come from behind the tree and just devour him. <laughs> and I would tape that. <laughs> and I started, I went there, got all the material I needed. I um, started with a head, uh, which I was found most important to be really real. I had printed out some pictures of him from different angles so that I would be able to do a three-dimensional portrait. And um, I had a hard time to deal with this work because it's very difficult to, to work with something you have never worked with, in a way. And um, uh, you, you just have to figure out how this material works. And, the time was kind of running against me because it was summer and this material would not last for very long. So I tried to sew these pieces together, put the eyes in the eye sockets, put the eyelashes around it and made this, this human being. I was very lucky, I didn't know then what I know now. Pigs have exactly our eyes, like blue, green, brown. It's exactly our size. And my husband had very blue eyes, and was blonde, and I found a pig exactly with his eyes. <laughs> and I, when I put these eyes in it, and the, the eyelashes, which were blonde, usually pigs have blonde eyelashes, it looked just like him. He, he looked at me, actually. And um, I finished the head, it was very smelly at the end, and at one point, I realized I cannot make the whole body and I cannot go through with the whole thing because it just all decayed, basically. And um, I kind of vomited over, the, over his head because he stank so much and he looked so real. It was really disturbing. So, um, and then I tossed him in the trash. I didn't take a picture. I didn't do the video. I didn't do anything, but my life changed. I was not furious anymore. I was just sad that my life didn't work out as I wanted it. But it was, it was life-changing because I understood, okay, it's a new part of my life and I have just to, to deal with it. And what I noticed at the same time, I really liked the material. I thought it was awesome. I had worked with a lot of material before, like stone, sandstone, jade, uh, clay, whatever material you ever get in your hands or your hands on in an art school. But this material that was so interesting because it was the real thing. You didn't depict something with something else, but you had the real thing. And that has a history and that spoke to me and to other people who saw it. At that time, nobody saw it, obviously, but later on. <clears throat> and I... <clears throat> Sorry. So I continued working with skin, with intestines, with um, 
organs, and I thought it was really interesting. I mean, there are possibilities you wouldn't, you wouldn't imagine just because of the material. So for two, from 2000, um, I, I moved to, to New York in 2003, and I, I had got a nice relationship with the meatpacking district, and they um, gave me everything I needed, and I, I tried a lot of things doing with this material. And after uh, three years, having done nothing but working with the skin, and then um, documenting it actually with photography, so because all the the, the sculptures I made were all gone, um, I thought I I want to make a book. I want to document what I did, and I um, uh, and I was totally frustrated because all the work I had done didn't look like. A style. I had this feeling an artist that was kind of my first time when I was an artist, a full-time artist, and I had this feeling I needed a style like recognizable. And I looked at all these photos I had printed out and felt this doesn't look like one person. It looks like several person, uh, several people did that. And I was thinking, how could I, how could I make, how could I make this work as one? kind of body of work or something. And I, I was thinking about skin, and skin is kind of giving you your identity, at least for the viewer. When you look at somebody who has an enormous rash, you, you almost don't recognize that person. So the skin is kind of very important for, for the viewer. And I was thinking I could make up new artists who don't exist, who have whom I would con um, di um, um, what is it? not distribute the work to give the work to um, con yeah exactly tribute the work to so um, I I made this book it is called Skin I function I'm, I have I have the function of a curator and I made up these people. So this is the first person, that's me, with a wig and with prosthetic makeup, meaning wax in my face and whatever. And I'm posing as this one of my artists, of an artist, um, and she makes a certain kind of work. For example, paintings. She paints onto skin, she uses wax and pigments to make portraits. This is another one. They look very like um, alive, or at least like embalmed people, very waxy, but you can kind of see through the skin because there are 20 layers of wax on top of each other, and between these layers um, are pigments, and this was actually an accident because in the last layer, I went a little too long with the iron over it, and so the, the pigments, I. I washed the pigments away, but the other layers still worked, so I kind of like that. This, uh, this was a friend of mine, Erica, and I loved her, to use her because she was so beautiful. So this is the second one. I gave them different names. The names of them, they were connected to people who were very important in my art career or in my in development as an artist. Um, her name was Paula Ebanista, and I have attributed my entire biography to these people. So the, she, was, she was the one when I was a professional gymnast and a seamstress. And she, I attributed to her all the, the work which I felt uh, fit to that person, for example, cloth, making cloth out of pigskin. That is woven pieces of pigskin. Or I, I um, sewed a lot of, of dresses made out of skin. That is not so much sewn, but I made it them with, with zippers and everything. Or I did these cutouts. They are a homage to Matisse. Um, there were several, it, I, I did a lot of them, put them in the, in the landscape somewhere. I sewed these cutouts together, 
left them in the landscape, photographed them when they were rotting. And this is Betty Horst, my alter ego. There, there is a lot of wax on my, on my chin, and I have, for example, covered my eyebrows and put them further up. And they, all the pictures are not um, changed with Photoshop. They are all actually real, um, uh, real made-up faces. And she was the one who photographed things, mainly pieces of animals, which looked totally different than what they were. So this looks, in my opinion, a little bit like a female body, but it is just a piece of pig skin. This looks like a, a skinned penis, but it is just a piece of meat, and so on. So this was the next one. She was my um, Mexican um, artist I found who was doing uh, stuff. Also a lot of wax in front of my skin, as you see. A little too much, maybe. Um, and she made, pro she made sculptures which actually um, uh, s didn't have to be photographed. They, they are preserved in different ways. So these are pig splatters. This is also made with a pig splatter where I first make a, a sculpture out of clay and then I cover the sculpture just with, uh, with, the, with this soft bladder, then I let it dry, then I spray either um, some kind of preservation on it or I do something like here that is plastinated with the technique of Gunther von Hagens, the guy who does these body world exhibitions. He, um, uh, he had his Institute of Plastination in Heidelberg where I had my bookstore. He was my, one of my best customers. So he, we got in contact later and I asked him if he would help me to use his technique of plastination on my work and he was extremely nice and supportive. That is a part of a sculpture. I, I put the whole sculpture together with single pieces. The problem with pigskin is you have only a certain amount of size with which you can work, so you have to get it together. At the beginning I was sewing everything, like here. These are surgical stitches. Only later I realized that I could just use um, crazy glue as you know, that works very well with skin. This is another one. She is, uh, she's covering everything with pig skin. Just these are boxes. It's called um, Twin Towers. This is actually a pig skin. <laughs> this, uh, just little things she covers with things. This is a body also made out of clay and then the, you can still see the staples of this. They are just, I, I covered tons of things with pig skin. <coughs> this is um, uh, one which looks very much, much like me, and she um, uh, is using the real thing. So this is a picture we made in a, a slaughterhouse uh, where some pig uh, was pregnant, and I used the fetuses, and I used these fetuses for many other pictures like this you will like because of the title. It's called Pigs in Blankets. <laughs> or this are playing pigs. And here I had them stored in a, an, um, in a way which was not so good. So after a while they looked like that. And I called that Until Death Do Us Part. Or I just used, what I really like is to use three-dimensional pieces of, for example, animal parts. In this case, a whole animal. It's a um, the little chicken, what is it called, quail. And um, the head is just a two-dimensional photograph. So, and I, the curator of this project, as a bookseller, um, I did a performance. And um, uh, I would like to show you this performance, which um, I might find. 
Yeah. Um, I did that in the Heidelberg Kunst Kunstverein, and uh, the people. Um, so this is my singing teacher. She is singing the text of a poem by Leonardo da Vinci, put in in music by. Um, Jesus. Um, his last name is Corbett, but I, uh, Sidney Corbett, and he um, he describes in this poem that he goes in a cave, and the cave is cold and. Uh, moist and he doesn't know what will happen in this cave and it was said the music was set for five voices she recorded four in the studio and was performing it live at the opening of the exhibition um, the exhibition was uh, there were war, there was work of all the seven artists and I was doing this performance where I have, um, where I wanted originally to slaughter a pig, but I'm very happy that I didn't do it. I never killed a pig, so I don't know if that would have been a good idea. And I had, um, I'm skinning the pig, cutting these pigs into kind of tiles and make something out of it, what you will see. It was a three-day performance. Um, uh, f I was working in the museum from morning to evening. Um, I had prepared the whole, the whole um, performance before in a studio in Heidelberg where I skinned 193 pigs to have enough material for this. Um, the the days of the performance are divided through um, an image of pigskin as you get it in from the slaughterhouse where you see a stamp on the skin which says that the skin is good to be eaten. And the filmmaker changed that stamp to the information which says that it was this performance in the museum and which day it was. So on day one, I kind of prepared the whole thing. And they used her singing and chopped it in pieces for, the, for this audio. So this is what I was talking about, the stamp with this information on it. So these are the prepared pieces of tiles made out of skin. And I had constructed, uh, uh, made this kind of construction for stapling 193 pieces of tiles onto the wood with 20,000 staples in one day and night. It took forever. And I was ready in the morning when we had to continue.
And here you see the exhibition. And this was the last day, and we put this... <coughs> this room together. And then I invited people to go in the room and touch the room. Our rooms, our original rooms were made out of skin, out of fur, out of um, the skins of animals. We lied on skins of animals. We, we dressed ourselves with skins of animals. Even in the Baroque time, we had um, wallpaper made out of skin. And at the end, we ate that pig, which I had skinned as a, a kind of example. And the experience people described to um, uh, touching the skin was, was really interesting because um, oops, oops. Um, oops. So I I didn't expect that I would show you the video. So I uh, but here are just some pictures from that again. And this is the next. Um, uh, Um, so they, they were all this, the seven people from the book. And the book <coughs> is called Skin. And if you want, you can just give it around and look at it. I had invited, <coughs> I had invited seven art historians to write about each of those seven artists. And it was a complete fake project. Only the people who were involved knew about it. Only the director of the museum knew about it and the writers. And we just acted like I'm the curator and this is a show of these seven female artists all in the same age, basically, who make this same stuff. <laughs> and I felt at that point that it was impossible to see that these are not seven different artists. But today I feel it looks like everything looks like, like the same and it was obviously done by one person. So um, and next, another project I did was working with meat. For this piece, for example, I put a huge piece of, or a lot of pieces of meat into the freezer and made a huge piece of frozen meat, like a block, like a stone. And then I carved stuff out of it. I carved portraits or busts, I carved babies, I carved everything what I could come up with. And um, I presented them at the opening of a show which was called Meat After Meat Joy, which I also curated but with real artists. Only one artist was not real, that was Betty Hurst, my alter ego, whom I always use when I do something where I don't want to reveal that I'm German. So I made a, a um, American flag, 200 pounds of meat with the red stripes are muscle meat, the white stripes are lard, fat, and it's just stapled onto a piece of wood. And I didn't mean to um, criticize as a German America, but I wanted to just criticize America. <laughs> 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 uh, 
uh, that was done in 2008, totally frustrated about Bush. And for the inauguration party of uh, Obama, we did something really nice. Um, I had a, a wonderful art dealer in New York, um, Daniel Mahmoud, and he agreed that I could harvest millions of maggots and put them onto the onto the flag just before the evening celebration of the inauguration, not inauguration, of the e election in November. And um, it was very difficult because these maggots who needed some meat to thrive, they stank so brutally that he actually literally passed out. And um, and then we, nevertheless, we did that outside. And it was, but outside it stank so much, it was unbelievable. And then we brought it, we sealed it, brought it in, and then uh, later the police evacuated the place because there was, <laughs> was really bad, even though I had found possibilities to spray on it with uh, stuff which is supposed to take away the smell and everything, but that wasn't so successful. Um, and this is the next project I did. And I actually will do the same thing what I did before. I will show you how that... Uh, was done. So, I... I told you the story about my first face I made out of pig skin and pig eyes and pig eyelashes and meat for the mouse. And I suddenly, after three years or four years, when I had totally forgotten about this first uh, face I made, I had this great idea to make a portrait or a bust out of clay and then just staple pig skin onto it. And I kind of did it in a completely different way because it was an, an art project now. But you can have a kind of idea how, how that is done and how I made that. And that is, by the way, the Overture of the Tannhäuser, just for those who wonder. So this, these pieces, which you see in the right, um, sorry, in the right top picture, they are pieces of the belly. Um, uh, the belly is um, very soft, very thin. I mean, the skin from the belly is very soft, very skin, and has very tiny pores. So the people I made out of this, um, uh, this skin from the belly, they all look relatively relatively beautiful and i think very soon now you see the other technique where i use the skin from the face and here i use just for the for the eyes um, for the eyelashes i use little pieces of hair from the wig I will later put onto the person. And in her case, I also used her to animate her and to let her talk because the the clay underneath of her of the bust is still uh, soft. So I opened the mouth, I closed the eyes, and I asked my friend to give her a voice. And she says, "I don't understand." And here, that is the um, I'm trying to figure out which which phase of a uh, pick I. I can use. I first skinned the face off a pig and then I tried 
what if I could use these eyes or if I should uh, these eye holes or should if I should just cut them out like on the right hand side in the on the right you see one of the pieces and here I'm trying to find out which are the right eyes which fit together because when I order eyes they just give me whatever 20 eyes and then they need to fit they are sometimes slightly bigger or slightly um, older and not so clear or they are uh, don't really match in the color same with the eyelashes they it's whatever so you have an idea um, um, Okay, so I made a book and I, because I really love to make books, and I had, um, I, I had the idea to make the book in the way I did it because when one of those people was sitting in front of me, it was like, it was a real person. It, the person looked at me and it was just a kind of miracle that the person didn't speak to me. It was so real. And I thought I could give them a life actually in um, in giving them a biography or a fictional story so that they have a life and become alive through that story. So I invited 27 of my favorite writers and asked them, gave them a, um, a portrait, like for example this, and asked them to come up with a story what they thought this woman went through, was thinking, has experienced, whatever. And the approach was that I would give them the, the people, but that they would write the story. And lots of them didn't react then that in the way I wanted. They said, oh no, I'm, I have no idea who that is. Um, and I, I'm not in the mood or I don't have time to write about her. Why don't I give you a story and you make the person who has that story so that you make her just in, in the way you feel about her when you read the story. And other people said, I have just written a piece. If you want to use that, you can use it, but you, then you have to make her. And a few of these people who had written something already, they were actually writing about real people. So that is, for example, um, Violette Nossier. She was a... She was 12 years old, a French girl who was raped by her father from 12 to 18. At the age of 18, she killed him. For that, she was sentenced to death. And I thought that was such an extremely interesting story. And I researched what she was looking like. Um, uh, and... I found some pictures online and I tried to make her in the way she looked like. This is the favorite story of my book. It is written by Lydia Millet. If you don't know Lydia Millet, you have to figure it out. She lives in Arizona. She's an amazing writer. She is very diverse and does many different things. But what she did for this book was um, she was writing a book and she had just... Uh, oh no, that, that was, I think, a collection of short stories. So this is a, a story about, that, that's supposed to be Madonna, in case you didn't recognize her. Um, she writes about her um, when she is on her estate and when, she, when they are doing this kind of hunting thing and they shoot, shoot birds in England with her ex-husband back then, her husband. And um, she, by chance, shoots a bird. And she walks towards the bird, and the bird is lying on the floor, and she thinks about eight pages what this bird was and how this dying feels. And if it was a girl, uh, if she has children, if whatever. And the way she, she describes that 
is so hilarious. I had to laugh out loud, probably between five and eight times. I don't remember exactly. But it was so hilarious and so amazing. And at the end, you had the feeling, oh my God, that's how she is, Madonna. So I, I thought that was amazing. Um, I also tried the first time in my life to do different races. So I have never made a, a Asian or black person before. I had never painted somebody who was not white. And it was such an interesting experience that we are so focused on our own whatever um, um, way how we look. And that we don't even, I, I, I was just shocked that I never came up with the idea of um, including other races in my work or, or even think about them. I, I, I found that very interesting. And I, um, this was, I, I was connected to the um, uh, woman, her name is um, Xing Su. And she's an amazing writer, very famous now in um, America, but still lives in in China. And she she gave me this story about a Chinese girl. So there was obviously that that was kind of the start of of doing that. And I, it, it was just very interesting to me. Uh, that is an albino woman. And I got, by chance, albino eyes from a pig. Can you imagine that here is somebody drowned? And she, I left her in my garden for a few days and let her uh, rot. And it's really interesting. I mean, this is real. Our eyes will look like that. Our mouths will look like that. This is real material who, which is decaying. And I thought that was very interesting. At a show, I actually, um, uh, I, I show the, the work in this way, that it is like an open book. And the story is printed out on 20 by, uh, or 30 by 20. And when the story is very small, you can see, you can read it from far away, big, big words. And when the story was in the book, a long story, you can, almost not even read it when you are really close at it. And the installation is one of my heads, which is very smelly in this gallery, and um, uh, with a kind of fake body, because all the busts I made, they are actually made uh, only the bust and not the entire body. So this was my third book I made, also a documentation. I actually... I was wondering, I had this, this book yesterday, um, the Heads and Tails book, and I don't have it today. Do you know if that... I don't know. Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter, but I wanted to give that around too, but I just realized I don't have it. Um, this is, I can give you the book. This was my um, third book project, um, where I make flowers made out of mainly intestines. So this is, for example, the vocal cord of a chicken. And I thought it would be interesting to, I, I was very much interested in in making these flowers in a way that you wouldn't understand that they are not real. I mean, this doesn't look so real, I, uh, I admit, but this one, for example, looks like a pretty real flower. And because I, w I, I took all photos outside in real light, and I placed, made them, placed them onto a branch or onto a, 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 a plant, and gave them botanical names. So um, I don't know if you know, but before Linnaeus changed our kind of nomenclature, we had polynomial flower names or 
um, botanical names, which meant there were a lot of names describing the flower so that you really knew what which flower that was. Then in 1855, this Carl Linnaeus came along and said, nobody can remember and understand all this system. You need a, a, a system which has only two names, a binominal system. And um, I went back to the old system, to this polynomial nomenclature, where I um, listed all the pieces which I used to make the flowers. In this case, these are duck tongues, and in the middle is a part of the stomach of a bull. A bull has four different stomachs, a very good source for a lot of different patterns and possibilities, just in case you would like to do that too. These are fish eyes, fish tails. These are the um, eating tools of a lobster. These are tiny little um, sepia squid bodies. Um, these are dried out heads of pig, uh, dried out heads of fish, and in the middle is the starfish part. These are claws of a uh, crab, and this you can guess obviously. I give you a hint: chicken is involved. The calm of a chicken. Actually, the calms of 17 chickens. These are tails of fish, which I found in Hong Kong. They have, the tails actually have this little yellow thing, which is uh, kind of helping them to balance in the water. I thought that was quite neat. This is this, these are skins of um, Atlantic surf clams. In the, the picture was taken in the Harlem Sea in New York. These are um, starfish uh, feet. Do you call it starfish feet? Arms. Um, the pieces of a butterfly wing, or of butterfly wings, and an eye of a fish. This is an esophagus of a deer with deer eyelashes, and again the skins of this Atlantic surf clam. And this is probably the realist, most uh, close to reality, but it's not a rose, as m the title of my book. And it is uh, it's the, made out of the tips of duck tongues. And I, um, for this book, I was really interested in why we love flowers, why flowers may lift us up, why they make us feel good. At least I know a lot of people who feel exactly that way, as I do. And I was also interested in how we use and abuse nature. And I have invited 100 people to write tiny little essays for the Not A Rose book to kind of explain why that might be that we like flowers so much. And for example, um, the, the texts were not supposed to describe my flowers or do some kind of art historical thing. They were supposed to really address the question of flowers. What, what are they? What do they mean for us? And um, to understand, I asked completely different people, I mean, people from completely different fields, like a neuroscientist who explains how scientifically smell functions. So what is actually going up on in our head when we smell something? How we distinguish the smell of a rose and the smell of a phrasia or whatever? And it is, um, you really learn something in this book. It is so interesting, just these tiny little essays, but they make you really have a, an idea about flowers. When you have read it, you definitely know why we like them and or why we might like them. You can pick your own idea of what you think is right. There are lots of ideas in it. And I really loved this collaboration with, with these people. And I encourage you to collaborate with people, either with artists or with non-artists, or with, with artists from different fields. It is so rewarding, and it makes actually the work more interesting, because you include something else which is 
which you wouldn't have if you were just doing your own stuff. And that is one thing why I love this college so much, because this is one of the very few colleges who has understood this interdisciplinary thing, not just like a, a fashion thing, but like the real thing, because life is interdisciplinary. So I, um, after I had signed the contract with the publishing house, I cried for three days because I realized I made a big mistake. All these pictures which you saw before, they were like of kind of snapshots of flowers and they didn't look like art. And the only thing I wanted to do was art. And when you saw this picture somewhere hanging, you thought, oh, okay, from a, a flower calendar or something. But you didn't think, oh my God, a Mapplethorpe maybe, a, a, a Vin Penn or some awesome artist. So um, I felt like the problem, what I had was this, with these pictures, which I uh, which are printed in the book, um, is that the focus is actually not on the thing itself, not on the artwork. I was so fixated onto how I can cheat people, how they would not realize that these are flowers, that I didn't pay really attention to the aesthetics of the single picture, and it totally frustrated me and I didn't know what to do. And because, because I had signed the contract, there was nothing I could do. So I had the idea to just make another book, a German edition. And in this I would use, I, I would understand this problem and would actually totally focus onto the flower. And you actually don't need this landscape, this big flower, uh, plants around it, all this area outside so that you see this, this is growing outside and alive. You actually only need something what kind of looks like a flower, a stem, some petals, some stemen, some things which make a flower a flower. So I started to, to do this with just a, a unique background or a monochrome background. This um, are um, pieces of, um, um, Jesus, uh, I start with the middle because I remember that better. That's the foreskin of a pig penis. And the petals, they are um, from, what? Uh, whatever, what, what is it? Just look at it. Uh, Exactly, and and I think it's it's not uh, um, the, is it the no the the tails are a little wider, but there are other pieces underneath of that, and they are this kind of small petally like, and this is an awesome piece. That is not a good solution. I'm sorry. You can go to my. No, it's not on my website. You can ask me and I send you a better picture. These are ears of tiny little pigs. And they have, there are hundreds of ears. And I got these pigs, uh, did I say pig? Mice, I wanted to say mice, sorry. I'm totally confused. Um, these are mice, ear, ears, ear mice, mice of ears, ears of mice, which are um, uh, just, about one week old, they start to grow this tiny, tiny little um, hair on the on the ear. Before that, they are totally naked, and you can see them here. This in the middle, these are heads of tiny little mice, baby mice, which normal people feed to their snakes. And the the red, beautiful petals around it, they are beet colored ears of rabbits. And then, this is another performance I did. Um, it's called Politics. I have sewn this flag with a factory um, sewing machine 
and cover it with pig's blood. And I then cover myself with that flag and it is addressing, it was done in 2007 on 9-11, addressing this situation that we use politics as a kind of code to cover up things we would normally not do, for example, kill somebody. And this was, I, I'm really interested in, in different kinds of material. So I made uh, insulation of a room which was completely made out of rust. I had this idea to put iron particles in paint and um, I thought if I later spray them with chloridic acid, I would make the particles rust and maybe the whole thing would rust and it worked. So this way I could rust everything I wanted, a, a plastic bag or, or walls and ceilings and books and everything. Um, this was a project I made um, because I was extremely angry about Jeff Koons, obviously. He has in um, fall 2013 sold the balloon dog orange for $58 million. And I was appalled. And normally I'm very happy when any artist makes money because I really think that's right and we should get something from what we are doing. But I thought that was appalling and I was working on, on this for a long time, trying to figure out why I was so appalled and what was wrong with the situation. And I thought, I have to do something. And I was going to do, to make a huge rusty dog, which in the same technique with this uh, balloon dog look. And I wanted to put it in front of the armory show on a truck. And it would be this rusty dog and it would be damaged and there would be graffiti on it and it would have a penis, kind of fuck you art world. <laughs> but, um, it, when I was working on it on the first leg for three weeks and hating it every single day to do the work, I stopped and thought maybe I should make it a little smaller. <laughs> I worked on the next size also for three weeks, hating it every morning and thought maybe I should go a little smaller. And when I did the smaller thing, it looked totally stupid and absolutely not interesting. So I went back to the bigger thing and thought I could undo this, this um, uh, uh, balloon dog. You know the, how the balloon dogs are made. So you have this, this um, balloon which is very long and then you turn it around, turn it around and, and put it around and then it, it, it comes in existence. And I thought maybe I could undo this and I should undo this huge balloon dog which I had made um, uh, the... the medium size, I finished that, but it looked so stupid that I didn't want to use it. And I undid it and connected these uh, single pieces and it looked like a huge kind of rusty sausage. And it was completely horrible and it was not usable and it didn't say anything, it was awful. So I thought I would really, and time went by and the armory show had already closed and but there was this other show coming up, Freeze Art Fair, and it's in May, nice weather, and I thought, okay, I will just do something completely different. I make tiny little rusty dogs that is about two inches big, uh, two, two, uh, 1.5 to 3.5 inches or something, very, very small. And um, I was going to make 10,000, and I was going to stand in front of the door of the... Um, uh, of the freeze art fair and hand everybody one of these little dogs and say, uh, and I had printed out a um, little postcard which addressed the value of art. What is actually interesting about art to us? What makes art valuable for us? And I wanted to say to the people, when you go in there, imagine there are no prizes, no names, 
what would be the artwork you would love? What would be valuable for you? What would be the price you would be willing to pay for that artwork? And it might be completely different than the reality in the um, fair. But I didn't figure it out because uh, 10,000 were uh, very, very pricey when I had them produced. And I couldn't produce them in a way that they were already rusty, so I would have also to put an enormous amount of money in it. And I was not connecting this project with my name because I, that was a kind of project where I only wanted people to understand what is that there is something wrong in the art world. And um, so I decided to make 200 by hand, which was also uh, very time consuming. And I was um, making a kind of stand outside of the Freeze Art Fair. It had a pole and all the rusty dogs were hanging on this pole. <clears throat> and I had printed out a lot of postcards and instead I gave the people a postcard and said, um, if you hold this postcard in your hand visibly, you agree that other people can talk to you, strangers can talk to you and talk to you about what is actually valuable in art. And you can go up to every person who has this postcard in their hand and you can talk to them what you think is valuable in art. And um, that was really beautiful project and I encourage you to do stuff which, which um, makes a kind of community or where you, in, where you ask people to think about something. That is, that is something which I'm really interested in that there is taking place some kind of communication between you and the other people and art is a wonderful possibility to get to that point, to start talking with other people. So this is another, uh, this is a book, a rusted book from that book room. And in 2010, there was this big oil spill in, uh, uh, done by BP and I was extremely upset. And I invited, a, I invited everybody basically to, uh, whom I know to make a, a show, a benefit show for Audubon um, Society who helped the birds to survive. And I had a huge collection of roadkill in my freezer. So I took them out and prepared them and covered them with oil and made a big show with these oil-covered animals that you actually see how that looks like because we are not there and we are not going there and only a few of us might have gone there to clean, help clean up. But it's really so shocking what is going on and I wanted to, to on the one side help but also criticize and make people aware. So this uh, opossums, I only had one opossum so I had to cut it in half so that I would have to this is a mole, and here I brought something for Sarah. Um, I did a, um, a project which was made out of chocolate. So this is a chocolate book. I invented a technique how to connect microcrystalline wax with chocolate. So the thing looks exactly like chocolate, smells like chocolate, but is a little more uh, Enduring, is enduring the right word, uh, than that. So, and uh, here is a homage to Tom Waits, chocolate Jesus. <laughs> and this is my last project. I think I'm a little late. Um, <clears throat> sorry. I go through that very quickly. Wh whoever wants to hear about that in a, in a, um, a closer way I will talk about that more tomorrow in a in a class maybe some people can come there so in 2008 my one of my closest friends committed suicide and I was completely out of my mind didn't know what to do was not really functioning uh, it had also to do with the fact that my father died under very uh, strange circumstances 25 years earlier and I was always convinced that that was suicide 
and I all the pain f with my father came back to me, and I I was really out of my mind. Uh, this is my father. And I had this idea to use their ashes and make portraits out of the ashes. I took a piece of wood, covered it with wax, took a scalpel, on the scalpel a tiny little bit of the ashes and inserted it in the wax at a certain temperature. So this is basically a mosaic. And every single piece of ashes is included into are inserted into the wax. This, hmm? yeah. Um, uh, in this case, my father and my friend, um, uh, I didn't have the ashes because in Germany you don't get the ashes. You don't get a, a hold on to a dead person, no matter in which consistency that person is. So I used a substitute, but I imagined it would be their ashes and how amazing it would be to have them actually in the way they, they looked like um, at your home. You could talk to them and they, it would be them. You would look at them and it would not only look like them, but it would be them. So I um, did that. It took me about six months to figure out the technique and everything, how, how that worked. And after these six months, I was totally fine. I was really over it. I mean, I still missed them, I still loved them, I didn't feel so much guilty as I felt before, but I was really uh, able to continue with my life. So I um, did that for other people as well. This is the mother of my art dealer, Ubu Gallery in New York. This is the father of my art dealer. And I made portraits for other people. That is a, the father of a friend, that is a brother of a friend. Um, and the interesting thing was, they all described their feeling exactly like the feeling I had. Although they didn't do the painstaking six weeks work on it, which I thought was so meditative and helpful to get over that. But it was, it was just the presence of the person and to see at the same time the likeness. So um, I'll just show you a few more. And I um, thought I, I really want to do that as a kind of social project. And I uh, uh, talked to my art dealer and he wanted to have $25,000 for a piece, which makes sense because it's a lot of work and I'm an artist and my work is not so cheap and but in this case I felt it was totally wrong because I didn't want to make it as an artwork these are commissions you cannot go in a gallery or you couldn't go in that gallery and say oh I like her how much is she she's the mother of somebody and she gave me her ashes so that I would be able to make that portrait so it's a totally different system. And I talked to a lot of art dealers and everybody said, don't, I, I, was, I was really interested in doing a, a social thing and work with funeral homes and make them, uh, give them a sample and tell them that they can ask for, um, uh, for that as a kind of alternative to an urn. And all the people in the art world said, it will ruin your career, don't do it. I think it will not ruin my career, and I'm doing it, and I found a new technique how I can make the same thing for $1,000. And then people have actually the possibility to get it, because everybody can kind of get together $1,000 for something like that. And when it is for them as life-changing as it was for me, it's definitely worth it. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry that I did talk so long. I uh, forgot to look at my uh, watch. So please ask fast and short questions.
Oh, and one more thing. I brought you two of those pictures. Here in the front, there are um, two original pictures. I can show it to you. In the picture with the woman, the ashes are a little more coarse, and at the uh, in the one in the other one, the ashes are more fine, like pigments. And I also brought something for you, just so that I don't forget. I have a bunch of old postcards from shows and stuff, and there are pictures on them. And if you want to uh, get something as a reminder of this, you can have them. Also, there are um, uh, kind of brochures in it how to get those um, uh, portraits made, so you can um, walk around here. Sorry. Oh. Um, I was wondering if you'd ever worked with any animal activists before, because you're so good at working like with the skin, if somebody would ever commissioned you for an animal rights project. Um, difficult. Because they think I'm their enemy, most of them. And uh, for, a, for example, Carol Adams, she wrote a big letter um, about my wrongdoing in killing animals for um, my artwork, which is absolutely not true. I use trash, trash from the slaughterhouse. There were a few, um, a few examples where that is not exactly true. We, we for example, eat um, uh, sepia, what is it called? Um, some things we eat, and of course, duck tongues are eaten in in different um, uh, countries and uh, as well. So uh, you could basically eat all the things, and that is one thing I want to address: that uh, the way we deal with with our environment and how we deal with factory farming, and that we. Um, produce billions of animals each year, which is completely absurd, and how they are treated, and what we do to them, and how we package them so that they don't look like animals, so that we are able to eat it, because as soon as we see what we are eating and what we are doing, we are, we are not doing it. Did you say in Germany the animal activists have a different attitude? Yeah, um, I in in I had a show in Boston and um, uh, in the Boston Globe there was this uh, letter to the editor that uh, or to the gallery that they should do shut down the show because it was would be so awful and I would be such a horrible person. And in Germany I had a show and um, the show was sponsored by Peter. And the, the, in Boston, that was a letter from Peter. So um, some people get it and some don't. Your work is some of the most brutal work I've ever seen. I think it's actually kind of dope. I was wondering um, if you have any ties or connections to death metal, if you listen to it, if you've been inspired by it, if people have asked you about no. not at all. I, I'm not inspired by it, and I don't listen to it. I actually don't listen to any music because I cannot listen and do something else. So when I listen to music, I have to sit down and close my eyes and listen to it. Even if I want to clean up or do something stupid, I cannot do it when I listen to music. So um, I, But when I listen to music, I definitely don't listen to it. Heavy metal. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I listen to to Das Lied von der Erde, to Mahler, to to a lot of classical music, and I like very, very, very much female voices. And there are quite a few nice female voices out there. And I did actually, uh, um, I organized a festival for female voices and invited. Every artist I know, every female artist who has a great voice, and we had a really beautiful party, and it was related to the death project, and everybody was supposed to sing a death-related song. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm interested in knowing how um, 
working so much with death has like changed your perspective on death and like how you feel about death? At the beginning, I didn't even realize that I'm working with death um, uh, for, I guess, more than 10 years. I only realized that when I started with this project. And it has changed my life in so far that I, understand, I understood that I have to die, which obviously is clear to everybody, but it wasn't clear to me. And I certainly didn't believe that I would die. Um, and I, I only understood that, uh, understood that very recently, and I, I really um, want to be aware of that. And I, I think I understood much more about life and death, and I have a strong opinion about death, and th think that we have to change our attitude to death, and have to integrate it in life, and have to deal with it in a different way, because it's a part of life. And we just push it away, we, it happens in the hospital, in the funeral home, we don't want to have to do anything with it. And I think our life would be very much enriched if, if we change that. Uh, for example, if we were sitting with a dead person and um, not getting rid of that, not calling immediately as if it was an emergency. Death is not an emergency. You can just sit with the person and it will change your life when you sit with that person because there's so much going on and you really understand that the person is dead and you understand a lot about yourself. So I encourage you, if somebody dies, you loved, don't let them bring immediately away. Even if the person dies in the hospital, stay in the hospital. Stay, just stay with the person. Stay there for a few hours, for 10 hours. It, the person will not, there will not happen anything to the person. He will be just dead. But what he can do for you, being with that, that person is unbelievable. Thank you, you're awesome. <laughs> Hi. Um, it seems to me, and probably all of us, that the work that you produce requires just great attention to detail and grueling labor and physical labor and an immense amount of research. And I want to know what kind of, what kind of sort of, like, deep drive and motivation to not just arbitrarily make this art, but to devote so much labor to it. Like, what does that feel like and where does it come from for you? And like, what is that, what does that madness feel like for you? I have no idea. I mean, that's just how I am, who I am. I think it helped a lot to grow up in the way I grew up. So I was one of many children, and uh, we had to do a lot of work on the farm. And I hated it. And I was really overwhelmed. I was tiny and had to do all these crazy things. And, was, uh, and, and being alone on a huge meadow for the entire afternoon when all my friends were in the in the swimming pool, and I had to put the hay together, and then my father wouldn't show up, and it would rain, and the entire afternoon was just gone and for nothing. It made me totally crazy. So I'm extremely um, kind of interesting, interested in not wasting time, and not doing anything twice, or I think one of my psychological problems comes from there. Um, the, it, it, I, I think when you, when you think about something really intensely, you, in my case, everything is kind of stored in my head, what I'm thinking about. And especially when I'm thinking about a project, most of my projects totally change from the very beginning to the end because I come up with new ideas, and this idea, I, I think the most important thing is to be